God is so amazingly predictable. Now, just even saying, putting those words in the same phrase seem contradictory. How can God be predictable? He's God, and, but he's predictable because he's chosen to be that way. He reveals himself by name. He reveals himself by his actions. He says, when, whenever I'm around, you can expect this kind of behavior. When, whenever I'm there, you can expect this kind of receptivity. When, when I'm there, you can expect me to love you. And there's so many things about God that he said, I want you to know what to expect when it comes to me. Now, I say all that to say that as I've gone through this 11th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we're going through the whole book, one, one chapter a week, chapter 11 is all about the predictable. It's, it's really, it's that, it's a couple of days, it's really two days out of the, the last five, seven days of, of Jesus' life here on earth. And, it, and it's all about these predictable moments that when this happens, you would expect God to respond this way, and you would expect God to expect this kind of response from us. So that's what I want us to do today, is I want you to look at that because I think it'll stretch you. When you begin to see how predictable God is about some facets of your life, it's going to free you up to give it your all. Some things you've kind of held back, maybe held God at arm's length and said, I'm just not quite yet re ready to go down that road yet. But when you hear about how predictable God is in some of these areas, it may be that which just pushes you forward. I'll show you what I'm talking about. If you got your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, and pull out your net note sheet too, because we've got a number of things put in there. Uh, we got, there are nine of these predictable moments. So what can you expect from God? What is so predictable about God? Let's start it off, we're going to start with Mark 11. And let me give you the first point, what you can expect from God. God has a plan, and that plan includes you. God has a plan, always has a plan, always had a plan, and he, include, he plans for you to be a vital part of that. Look at verse 1 of Mark 11. Jesus is just now coming close to Jerusalem, and now he's there. And it says in verse 1, As they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are, they, are you doing this? You are to say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. So they went away. And they found a colt tied at the door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of the bystanders were, sta were saying to them, what are you doing untying this colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. So I hope you see, I mean, there's evidence of a plan here. How could Jesus tell these guys, go down into the valley, you're going to find a colt back there, bring it back. But also, before you bring it back, you, there's going to be some folks give you some resistance, push back. What are you doing taking that colt? You just tell them the Lord has need of it, and that'll be, that'll be a sufficient. There is a plan. How Jesus was able to work that plan out and get the word to all these folks, we don't know. Maybe God sent ma angels to different ones of these characters to prepare them. But it doesn't really matter. What matters is this is evidence of a plan, and it's a plan that involves us. Ultimately, I mean, it's going to involve the disciples here, but he's using this as an example for all of us. God wants us to be a part of this plan. Well, this is so interesting. You know, God is a planner. At, throughout the Old Testament, he gives us uh, a, a blueprint for his plan for the future. God is all about planning. So if God is all about planning, and if God does have a plan, and that plan does include us, then what does God expect from us? If it is predictable that God would want to enforce his plan, or to at least pull the trigger on the, the plan, and he wants to involve you, what would that require from us? How can we join him and, and feel confident about the whole thing? Well, there you'll notice under each one of the points is a response. What is your response to be? Do what he says. If God has a plan, and he points out how you are to be a part of that plan, your only course of action in light of who God is, is to simply say, I'm in. Why? Because he's God. He's always perfect. He knows what he's doing. And what's so great about all that is, he's opened it up and said, come join me. Come on, let's go. So how do you respond? You simply do what he says. Why? Because when you obey God, it changes you. 
It changes you. In fact, listen to this. John 14, verse 21. John 14, 21 says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will, and here it comes, disclose myself to him. Here, Jesus is saying, if you, do what I, if you have my commandments and you do what I say, then you can expect to be blessed. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to reveal myself to you. I'm going to manifest myself to you. The many different translations there. He's saying, listen, when you choose to follow my lead and obey me, you need to know that you're on your way to the road of intimacy with God. That's why it's so important. God is so predictable. He, we know God wants us to be close to him, so he's going to orchestrate his plans and all the other things around us to enable us to, tie, to tap into that intimacy factor with God. If you're there and want to know him, want to know God, you want to, you want to move forward with him, then you need to do what he says. You need to acknowledge that he has a plan that includes that. You need to say yes to whatever you've been saying no up to this point. Say yes, do what he says. Now that brings me to the second way that God is predictable. And that is this, God always keeps his word. God always keeps his word. He, he doesn't have it in him, the ability to, to lie. Because by nature he is truth. Listen to this, Mark 11 verse 7. It says, they brought the colt to Jesus, put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the, in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed him were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed is the coming kingdom and of, our, of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is Palm Sunday. This is when Jesus makes the triumphal entry down the valley straight to the temple. This is what we're talking about here. This is the, the few days before Jesus is about to be crucified. This is what's happening here. So these folks are coming down. Now what's so significant about this? The fact that they're laying palm branches and clothes in front of the colt and, and on the colt and all that. It's, it's God's way of saying, this is the Messiah that you've been promised. Throughout the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, the book of Zechariah, it talks about this coming Messiah that will ride on a colt that no one else has ever ridden on before. I mean, they, they, God just lays it out there and says, he is coming, this is what he'll be like, this is what you can expect. As, as I said before, God is so predictable. He's saying, this is what I want you to anticipate. This is what's going to happen. He says, I want you to look forward to the future. Listen to this. For those of you who are a little nervous about God's plan for your life, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, is God's way of summarizing the kind of plan that he would have for our lives. It's a word to the people of God, the Jews, in light of all that they have done and they've turned their back on God, you would expect God to say, I'm finished with y'all, no more. But instead, he sends Jeremiah to tell them, he says, it's not over yet. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Translated, this is God saying, I have an incredible plan for you. It's laid out for you. I want you to be a vital part of this plan. He says, I, I, I've never lied before. I make lots of promises. I, I, give prophetic, I give prophets prophetic messages to give you so you know what's going to happen down the road. Just so you would know, I know what's going on. I know what happens past, present, and future. I am in the know, God says. He says, and you need to know that I will always keep my word. If I promise you something here that won't take place for, for hundreds of years, you need to know I'm going to keep my word anyway. That's just the, my nature. God is so predictable. And then that brings me to the third way he's predictable. God values his temple. God values his temple. What does that mean? Look at verse 11. This is the first thing he did when he entered into Jerusalem. Remember, he's riding the colt into Jerusalem, gets off the colt, and here's what happens. Verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem, came into the temple... And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. He came into the temple and looked around at everything. I thought when he went into the temple, he turned over all the tables and he was really upset with everybody from turning the temple into a place of merchandise. That's true, but that doesn't happen yet. That, that's what happens next, the next day, as a matter of fact. But here... This, and this is a passage, I think we just, we just breeze through and don't even think about it. But it's really important that we read that. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany. So he just went to check out the temple. 
What does that say about God? What, how does that reveal his unpredictable or his predictableness? It's God's way of saying, I value the temples. I, 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 God, I, God, created these temples for a reason. He says, and I value them. So when he comes down to the bottom of the Kidron Valley and he walks on into the temple, he just checks it out. He's spying it out. Now, apparently the next day he comes back and that's when he turns everything upside down. But right now, he's just looking. And you can just imagine him sitting there thinking how it's breaking his heart to see what's happened to the temple, the temple that used to be a place of prayer. You can just imagine these things. But that's what he's doing. He's just scoping it out. Why is he doing this? Because of how valuable the temples are to him. In fact, that's number three. Number three is God values his temple. God values his temple. This is the first thing he did when he gets to Jerusalem, is to check out the temple. Now, before we get to the place where he, un he upheaves all of them, turns them all upside down, I want you to understand that when the temple is talked about, it's talked about two different ways in the Bible. The first way is the second way. Uh, it's talking about the temple being the place where the Holy Spirit lives. When a person becomes a Christian, when they open their heart to Christ and they say, come on in and, and confess their sins before God, God, the scripture says that God sends his Holy Spirit to indwell you. God sends his spirit to take up residency in you. The Bible actually flat out says that you are now the temple of the living God. In fact, let me read, just read portion of that to you. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It says, or didn't, didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place? the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? The physical part of you is not the piece of property belonging to a, physical, a spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works, so let people see God in and through your body. What he's saying is, one way to look at the temple is to understand in New Testament wise that if you are a Christian, the Spirit of God is living in you. That's so, so when you're living life and you start feeling guilty about something that you've just done, you need to know that's the Holy Spirit in you prompting you with guilt, convicting you of your sin. That's, he's there to prompt you. He's also the one that gives you wisdom. When, when you're praying for wisdom and don't know what decision to make when you do that, the Holy Spirit resides in you. He's going to give you wisdom. And throughout the scripture, it deals with that time after time after time. God says, I want you to know that's a very valuable piece of property is you, the temple. In fact, that may, that may reveal to you, you know, sometimes because the Spirit of God resides in you, it could be that you step onto a scale and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, you know that's too high, right? <laughs> Why would he say that? Because he cares about his body. It's his body. It's his temple. He wants you to take good care of that temple. He wants you to make sure that you are taking good care enough to where it stays in pretty good shape. God says, I want you to know that the temple belongs to me. He says, so I want you to take care of it while you're able. That's, that's one facet of the temple. But the second part happens to be the temple that people built. And it's, you know, what was the purpose of that temple? That's where people came and they, uh, they offered their sacrifices to God. That's where they worshiped God. That would be the temple that Jesus saw when he went in there. He saw that temple and it grieved his heart to see the way it was being used now. But why is that even important? Because the function of the temple does not change. It's, it's always been about you worshiping God. When you come to the temple, you come to worship God. But you can't worship God until you deal with personal sin. So you offer sacrifices for your sin. And then the sins, then you, then you uh, bathe yourself and make sure that you're cleansed from all unrighteousness before you even come to offer the sacrifice. All of that's inherent. When you come into the temple, it's all about what is God saying to me? How would he, what would he say to me today? How can I respond to him? It's all, it's all about having that place where you can do that. At, at the moment, Jesus happens to see it made in you know, stones. But God says, but there will always be a temple, this kind of temple, for you and for me. God wants there to be a place that you can come and worship God on a regular basis. God wants you to have a place where you can come and open up God's word and dig into it and read it and learn from it. God wants you to have a place that you can just sit and think about the things of God and, and memorize those passages of scripture. He wants there to be a place that you just think of when it comes time to spending time with God, you know exactly where that place is. It could be your bedroom. It could be the living room. It could be in your car. It could be any number of places. This is, just happens to be the place that you know that you can finally get quiet before God and listen to God. The temple. God is saying, I value my temples. 
And I want you to value them too. So if he does consider your temple, temple being the body of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the vehicle or the, the place that God's Spirit resides, if that's the case, and you have a place maybe in, in, at home that you set aside to, to function as a temple, then how should you respond? Well, your response, look at your notes there, treat both temples with respect. Treat both. Don't just treat one or the other. Treat them both with respect. I, I love the way the psalmist puts it when it comes to that sacred place. It says in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. He's talking about that place that you get alone with. God. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the sacred place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. So it's identifying a lot of different places that function as a temple. He called it the tabernacle, the temple, the tent, the, the, uh, put him on a rock. He says it doesn't matter that which location it is. It, the, what matters is that it is a location that spurs you to worship God, spurs you to listen to God, makes you want to know more about God. That's the importance of the temple. God is so predictable. Number four, he is so predictable that he prioritizes relationships. God prioritizes relationships. I want you to see something. Look at verse 11 again. It says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for where? Bethany. Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. Now, Bethany wasn't a lady that was walking with the twelve. Bethany is the name of a little community where some people lived that were very close to Jesus, some of Jesus' best friends. You remember Mary and Martha? They lived here in Bethany. You remember Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother, lived here in Bethany. Do you remember, do you remember in the Old Testament, you've got Abraham who's called the friend of God. How could anybody gain that? That's God speaking of Abraham and says, he's my friend. Wouldn't that be amazing if God would say that to you and to me? It's such, it, God's desire is that there be a relationship in, that we both have, that we share, that becomes more and more intimate over time. That's what he's talking about here. He, the passage, this is so wonderful, wonderfully stated here, that it says that Jesus came down to the Kidron Valley uh, on that colt, and then while he was down there, he, he checked out the temple there and looked to see what it says. But then it just mentions this city called Bethany. Why did he do that? Because it doesn't talk about it anymore after that. It's because of the relationships that Jesus cherished here. You think about it. Jesus, about four days from now, is going to be crucified. Who does he want to be sure to see before that happens? His closest friends. Maybe to get, fill them in and say, it's almost time to do what I told you all what I was going to do. Or it could be that he knew he'd get con consolation. He'd be comforted some by his friends. It doesn't really matter. It's just this is a place where he came together with friends. God's all about relationships. God said in the book of Genesis, he says, I created this and it's good. I created this, it's good. This is good. This is good. I created this and this is not good. What, did he, what was he talking about when he said this is not good? That a man should be alone. His whole point is, I created man with a, with a need for relationships, with a need, especially this one particular relationship, his wife. But the principle applies across the board. God says, I have made you in such a way where you need friends. You need to spend time with friends. That's why he prioritizes relationships. So if that is the case, then how should we respond? If, if, if God prioritizes relationships, here's how we respond. Write this down. Receive God's love. Receive his love. Instead of pushing him back, instead of making reasons why there isn't any God who really cares, he wouldn't, if, he, if he really loved you, he wouldn't let you, he wouldn't make you go through these difficult times. Instead of going down that road and pushing back, just receive his love. In fact, just take this one verse to heart. It's a verse that most of you have memorized. John 3.16. For God so what? Loved the world that he did what? Gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God's simply saying, you need to know that my desire for your life 
includes this relationship. He says, but the thing that's keeping it from happening is you by holding your hand out toward God. Leave me alone. I don't want that. I can fix it myself. God is saying, no, you can't. You were born into this world a sinner, and sinners offend me. The sacredness of God. Sinners, because you're born as a sinner, that means we know how it ends. The wages of sin is death. But I love you, and I didn't plan for you to ever have to experience that kind of life that had death included. So he says, so what I did was I stepped out of heaven. My name's Jesus. I stepped out of heaven, and I laid my life on the line there and said, go ahead and kill me. I'll give you my life because I want to be that sacrificial lamb that dies in your place. You're guilty, so you have to pay for it unless someone else chooses to die for your sins. Jesus is guiltless, innocent, because he's God. So he can lay his life on the line for you. When the scripture says God so loved the world that he gave his only son, it was God's way of saying you don't deserve it, you didn't earn it, still don't. He says, but for God so loved the world, he says, I'm going to love you anyway, that I give my son, my only begotten son, so that if you simply receive him and what he did, you can have a brand new life, a forgiven life, an eternal life. If you want that, then you simply have to respond the way I've already mentioned. Just receive God's love. You can't do any better. You can't fix your problems. All you can do is simply receive his love. Sin hinders this, but you've got to receive his love. So let me stop right here. Let me just ask the question. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Has there been a time in your life where you said to God, I'm a sinner born apart from you, separated from you, and I need you. I believe, Jesus, you died on that cross for me. I believe on the third day you rose again from the dead and you offer me it's eternal life where I can live forever, but also live knowing that only true God. Have, have you ever done that? Because God is simply waiting for an invitation. He's already taken care of everything. He's just waiting for you to simply say, I'd like that. I don't deserve that, but I'm in. If that's you, it can happen now. Don't wait any longer. I, you're not, you and I are not guaranteed another day. So we don't know how much time we've got, but I can tell you, you've got this moment and you've got this pastor here who's begging you to do so because it'll change everything. Sometimes it's hard to believe that God could be that good, but God, God is so predictable. He loves you even when you don't deserve it. You're saying, but I don't deserve it. Right, but God is predictable. He loves you anyway. It's because of the predictable nature of God that you and I know that at any moment if we were to embrace that truth that Christ died for us, that he rose again from the dead for us, and that he offers this life if we just accept it. If you'll do that, it's done. In fact, let's, let's do that right now for some of you who need to do that. Let's just bow our heads. Just bow your heads right where you are. Close your eyes. Nobody looking around. I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy, not raise your hand or nothing like that. But if you know that you need Jesus, you need to receive him as a gift from God that died for you on the cross and then on third, the third day he rose again. If you need that Jesus and you're open to it and you're willing to receive him, pray. Just pray. Tell God. Your prayer might go something like this if this helps. You can just tell him, that's what I mean. Dear God, I am a sinner and don't deserve forgiveness. But it's my understanding that Jesus was sent by you to die for me. I accept that, I believe that. And in return, I turn from my sins and I turn to you and I give you what's left in my life. I believe that when Jesus rose from the dead that it opened up life for me, eternity, life. I want to, I want to live the rest of my life for you. Lord, I choose to stop rejecting you, but today I receive you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now listen to me, if you did pray just then, God heard you. It's not me, I don't save anybody. I have to do the same thing you do. I have to cry out to God for mercy, just like you do. But when I did, he changed my life. And if you just did, he changed your life. And you've just begun the new journey. 
And I would love to talk to you after the services about it, just to give you a heads up. But please, that's what we're talking about here. Because God is so predictable, if you just accepted his gift as truth, you need to know that it's yours. And now it's just a matter of discovering what it's like, living it out. Now that brings me to number five. God is so predictable. God takes productivity seriously. Fruitfulness. He wants your life to matter. That's what that really means. God is so predictable, he's going to do what it takes in your life to make your life productive. Look at verse 12. He says, On the next day when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he found it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And then he said these strange words. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. What? Why did Jesus say that? I mean, what's the deal here? The big deal here is that God takes fruitfulness, productivity, seriously. He created these fig trees to produce figs that would quench the hunger of people who would eat it. And guess what? When Jesus said it's time for him to have that, this fig tree was not ready. And so there were consequences. God takes productivity seriously. He doesn't want you to settle for anything less. In fact, that's your response there. Write that down. Your response, don't settle for less than God's best. It's all about, if you, if you just write this, this down, um, pro, um, John chapter 15 is all about this picture of who we are and how we relate to God using agriculture as, a, as an example. And it says in the beginning, it says that God the Father is like the gardener and Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And it talks about how bran uh, some branches are grafted into the vine. So that's how you were born, not grafted in, but once you are born again, when you give your life to Christ, you're grafted in and the life of the vine flows through the branch and bears fruit. In its season. All of that's true. Well, the whole, then the, pretty much the whole chapter 15, John chapter 15, is about that very thing. This is really just a visual on how seriously God takes that. God wants us to be very productive. He doesn't want us to ever settle for less. It's so easy for us to say, well, I don't have to be that committed to God. And I don't need to, God says, listen, I want all of you or I don't want any of you. I want every bit of you. It's, it's like, again, I've, I've shared this with you before. Stephen Olford said, if he is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. That's what we're talking about. God says, I, I, have, a, I have a desire that you know me, that you walk with me, that you experience life with me. He says, but you're not going to do that if you, don't, if you settle for anything less than my best. Now, that brings me to the sixth predictable moment, and that is that God wants his people to pray together. God wants his people to pray together. This is really important to God. Look at verse 15 of Mark 11. It says, Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. The chief priests and the scribes heard this. These are the big cheese in the, in the Jewish faith. They heard this and they began to seeking how they could destroy him. For they, they were afraid of him. For the whole crowd was astonished at his teachings. They were totally misusing. Now Jesus, this is the next day, he goes into the temple and sees all this going on. And he's turning the tables over. He is so angry. He is so mad. He's saying, this place should be known as a, a place of prayer, not a place of merchandise. So what he's saying that basically what you've done is converted this temple into a Walmart. And the Walmart has everything you could possibly want except for what you need. And that's to be a place of prayer. Now God's not against Walmarts. But he's against temples that become Walmarts. God's all about prayer. It's that important to him. That's what God, this is his point. I mean, he's coming down there, he's saying, he says, this ought not to be what it is. You need to be praying with each other. If, for what reason? Because that's our only hope. The nation of Israel has, has, has a black mark on it in that it's always been disobedient to God throughout history and, and you got episodes of it time after time throughout the Old Testament to teach us how, f f how vulnerable we really are. And so here he is, he's, he talks about that and in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, 
God speaks about the role that God's people can have in the restoration of a nation, especially their nation. Here's what he says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And my people who are called by my name, if they humble themselves and pray and they seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their land and, or forgive their sin and heal their land. God says, look, I'm willing to take action here and restore and replenish and forgive and give you a brand new start. But you have got to be willing to pray and repent. That's what he's talking about here. He says, I want my people to learn to pray together. My response, here's the response you want to write down in your notes. Make time to pray with other believers. Make time to pray with other believers. Look for opportunities. There are prayer meetings that our church alone schedules all over the city, uh, all different times of the day, for you to join and be a part of a group. Some groups have as, as little as two or three meetings. Some people have hundreds of people meeting. But understand, it's all about, not about how big or small the group is. It's about are you willing to take the initiative and find a, somebody that you can pray with or somebody's to pray with? Are you willing to take that time? The prayer guide that we put together for these 60 days of prayer, it's, it's a perfect example of, of a way for us to respond in prayer, but you bring people around you and you can interact with it. It's designed in that way where both of you or all of you around the table could, could read the scriptures and talk about what God's wanting to do in your life in addition to changing things. This is so important. God wants his people to pray individually, corporately. That's why we spend time praying here every Sunday morning. While everybody's together, we pray because we know that's what God wants. We're not doing just, you know, we think this would fit good in the service and all that. No, we want to put the elements in there that God has already told us that he likes. He's so predictable. He, he doesn't just tell us to meet together. He tells us what he wants going on when we meet together. Now that brings me to number seven. God wants you to trust him and accept his agenda. God wants you to trust him and accept his agenda. Look at verse 11. Now remember what's just happened here. Jesus is in the temple, really upset, turning over the table. He says, this should be a place of prayer. And then he says in verse 20, And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. So he's moving, he's going in the opposite direction from the temple. And being reminded, Peter said to him, now doesn't that sound like Peter? Peter's always got to have something to say when things are happening. He always opens his mouth, inserts his foot. So here he does, he sees Jesus, uh, he sees this fig tree that Jesus cursed when they went by it last time. And he's saying, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, no kidding. I, that's not what it says, but that's what it means. I mean, the whole time Jesus is trying to teach the disciples that when God speaks, he follows through on what he says. It's always about the trustworthiness, the predictability of God. And so here it is. Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you curse is withered. And Jesus answered, saying to him, have faith in God. He's saying, well, I don't know why you're so surprised. Trust me, have faith in God. That's what that means. And then verse 23, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Now listen to me. There's a lot of people who want to turn prayer into some kind of magic formula to get God to do what he wants God to do. This passage is not teaching that. This passage is not saying if you pray this in this way and do this, you can just say to that mountain over there and it'll go into the sea. That is not what he's saying. What he's saying is what he's been saying all along. The object of your faith uh, is the, the most important thing. I am the object of your faith. Because of who I am, you can ask for things. It's because of the way I am, you can ask for things. He says, but, but, but you need to be reminded, he says, if you pray anything according to my will, it will be done for you. So it's important for us to know God personally, but to also know his heart and know what his agenda is, know what his plan is. And when you know what his plan is and what his heart is, then it's real easy for us to pray concerning things that we know God's going to answer yes to. God's always going to give an answer to a request that has to do with his plan. Always. You, pl you pray according to his will, and God says, I'm going to answer. That's what he's dealing with here. He's saying what's really the vital part of this component is not that the formula, there's not a special formula, it's that I'm God, and I always follow through on what I say. I never lie. When, when, when I tell you I wanna, I'm planning to do something, I mean it. I'm planning to do something. That's what he's doing. 
So, so the, the whole point of this thing is God wants us to trust him and accept his agenda. If that is the case, how are we to respond to that predictable God? Here it comes. Study God's word and then apply it to your life. Study God's word and then apply it to your life. How are you going to know what God's will is unless you spend time reading about it? The scriptures are given to us by God so that we know what God wants, so that we know what God's priorities are, so that we know what God's will is. We know things like, the scripture says it very clearly. It says, for it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's way of saying, I don't want any of you to miss out on eternal life. None of you. It is not my desire. I've, I've put everything in place so that you can have life. We know that. So you need to pray for people that are drifting and lost and and, and confused. You need to pray for them. God will answer that prayer. It may not be in the timing that we set, and it may be done differently than what we'd hoped for, but let me just tell you, God's going to pray. When you pray about things like that, God's going to answer. And the scripture's full of, of passages like that that reveal his will to us. So, how are you going to know what it is? Studying God's word and then applying it to your life. Then, number eight. God sees forgiveness as a gate to spiritual intimacy and growth. God sees forgiveness as the gate to intimacy and growth. God says when you learn to forgive and when you practice forgiving, you can expect God to get involved and you're going to grow. When, when you're truly willing to forgive, no matter how you feel about it, when you choose to, 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 to actually forgive a person, then God says, I'm going to be there and work that thing out. It's like you open up the gate for God to come in and step in and do something. It's only when you forgive. I mean, listen to what it says. Mark 11, 25. This is the very next thing that happens. It says, whenever you stand praying, forgive. He's been talking about how important prayer is, remember, and how you need to pray to the God who can do anything, because if you pray according to his will, it'll be done. All right, verse 25. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. So he's adding this component. He says, don't just pray. I want you to forgive. Forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. It's that important to God that we learn to forgive. We, we've got to forgive. Because when we choose not to forgive, what we're doing is assuming responsibilities that belong to God, not us. What responsibilities am I talking about? The responsibility of being a judge. When somebody hurts you, do they deserve judge, uh, judgment and justice? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You do too. So how does that get done? Well, you could make times really hard for them you could jump into that situation and, and retaliate, give retribution. God says, but that's not your role. Once you do that, it changes you. When you do that, it allows for bitterness to continue to eat at you. It makes things even worse when you don't forgive. Yeah, but they don't deserve to be forgiven yet. They need to pay for what they did, and I totally agree. And God totally agrees. The question is, who makes them pay? You, the one who got hurt, or God, the one who sees everything? The one who's very able and to do it just right. Knows all the details. Who? But I don't want to. I want to make sure he hurts first and then I'll give him over to God. God says, no. Forgiveness gets in the way of prayer. You can pray and pray and pray, but if you don't forgive, it just kind of puts a roadblock right there. You can't go any further. Listen to this. Romans 12, verse 19. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go and buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Forgiveness is giving up your right to be the judge. That's what forgiveness does. And so let me give you the to-do. How should you respond? Don't wait for forgiving feelings before choosing to forgive. And that's, our, that's our issue, really. I don't feel like they should be forgiven yet. Don't wait until you feel that way, because you'll never get around to doing it. It'll always be too late. And in the meantime, it eats at you, changes you. So what he's saying is, let me be judge. There shall only be one judge, and that's God. That's what you want to do. God is so predictable. He's just trying to protect us. 
He knows that if we refuse to forgive, it will eat us up on the inside and develop a spirit of bitterness. And God is simply saying, give that to me. I really do love you. He's predictable. He says, I will take care of you if you'll let me. That's, that's the way God is. Now, that brings me to the last area that God is so predictable about. It's this, God resists spiritual chameleons. God resists spiritual chameleons. You know what a chameleon is. It's like a lizard whose outside skin is able to transform colors to fit its environment. So you, you can go to the chameleon, try to grab it, and all of a sudden it changes colors right before your very eyes to blend into what it is. Just a, it's, a, it's a defense mechanism. God says, I want you to stop being a spiritual chameleon where you change colors depending on who you're around. Listen to what happened next. Mark eleven twenty seven. 27. They came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. Now again, he's back in the temple. This is the third time that we know he's been in the temple in three days. He's in the temple. He says, by what? And they began to ask him. They, they're trying to trap him. By what authority are you doing these things? Or what gave, gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. And you answer me. And then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John, talking about John the Baptist, from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? But shall we say from men? Well, they were afraid of the people, for everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. So answering Jesus, they said, We do not know. Liar, liar, pants on fire. They do so know. They just don't like what they know. They're in it for the power. They don't want, they don't want to go down that road. They're chameleons. They, they change colors depending on who they're with and what they want. Verse 33, answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus doesn't like this one little bit. In fact, if you fast forward to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, this is Jesus sending out a letter to seven different churches and to this one particular church who had an issue with being spiritually chameleons. Here's what he says. Revelation 3 verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Literally, that word spit means to vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick. This is Jesus. He's saying, when you act out the chameleon, he says, you're making me sick. He says, there has to be the, the part of you that stands up for what's right. Stands up for truth. That's what he's dealing with right here. He says, there needs to come a time when you take a stand. Now, you, you're familiar with times when we do that. You think about today. When, when we go down to the beach and we baptize these 30-plus people that are going to get baptized, these are people who have said, I'm in, I belong to Jesus, and I want everybody to know it, so I'm, get, I'm getting baptized. And when they get baptized, they go under the water. That's the picture of the death and the burial of Christ. Then they come back out of the water, and it's the picture of the resurrection of Christ. So when they're out there on the beach getting baptized, they're saying, I believe in the Jesus who died for me and was buried in a tomb. And then they come out, and I believe in the Jesus who rose again from the dead and offers me life and plans to live his life through me from this day forward. That's, that's taking it. And that's saying that you have a conviction about something. God is saying, I want you to really mean it or not. I don't want you to play games with me. But that's what you do when you get baptized. Every person who gets baptized, they're saying, I belong to Jesus. Count me in. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you haven't. And if you haven't done that yet, you need to take a stand for who you are in Christ. Because it makes God sick when you play around, beat around the bush. He wants you to honestly jump on board and be all in. If, you're, if you are willing to do that and you've not, you want to, listen, we'd be glad to baptize you out of the beach. Anyway. You just meet us out there. Get there before 6. At 6 o'clock, they're going under the water. But you get there before 6, you could be in line. They're going to make sure they put a t-shirt on you so I don't baptize the wrong person. Okay? You'll have a colored t-shirt on there. But just know, that's, you need to take a stand. If you haven't yet, 
That's what this is all about, it's taking a stand. It's saying to God, I am no longer going to live the life of a chameleon. But then there's another way that you take a stand. And that's whenever you partake of the Lord's Supper. When you partake of the Lord's Supper, at that last, ta- at that last night when Jesus met with the disciples, Jesus told those guys again what his plan was. They still had a hard time with it. He says, but in essence, he says, what we're doing is establishing a new covenant not an old covenant based on the law, a new covenant based upon my grace and what I'm about to do. And so whenever you partake of the Lord's Supper, you take the bread. The bread is a picture of God's body that was murdered and killed for us. And then we take a little of the juice, and the juice represents his blood, which says that he he bled and died for us. That's how you take a stand. And that's what we're going to do right now. This is for those of you who have received Christ. I want you to take your little cup that you you came in with and if you didn't get one of these cups it has both the bread and the juice in it raise your hand because our deacons will just come and bring it to you right where you are somehow you slipped in I can't there's one over here I think and hold your hand up high so they can see you as they wander around there you are good there's a couple back yeah behind you anybody else we missing somebody up near the front no All right. Now I want you to I want you to kind of hold on. Here's one up here at the front row. It sounds looks like Glenn. Yeah, in the middle of the second row. There we go. I want to read to you part of what the Apostle Paul said about that final night when Jesus took of the elements. He says, The Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the blood and the body and the blood of the Lord. What does it mean, an unworthy manner? It's to play the role of a chameleon. I mean, obviously, you know whether or not you've given your life to Christ or not. You also know if you're acting like a chameleon. It's at moments like this, Suzette's going to be playing, and we're going to take just a few moments for you just to get quiet and still before the Lord. And if you've been living the life of a chameleon, this is your time to say, God, I'm sorry. I want to move forward from here. I need you to empower me to no longer live that way. You need to confess to him so that he does a fresh work in your life. Otherwise, it's as though his death and resurrection meant nothing. So what I want to ask you to do is just be thinking about those things, confessing your sins, any sins that God brings up, confess them to the Lord and let the Lord forgive you right there and then and cleanse you. And then we'll move forward to taking the elements together. But just take a few moments just to think through and to meditate on what God has been saying to you all all along this message. And then I'll come right back to you and walk you through this.
want you to take your cup and the juice part will be on the bottom. Peel off the top, which has the bread. Scripture says, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. By taking this, you're saying, Jesus, you gave your life for me. You came and suffered greatly for me. I want you to know that I appreciate it. And I want to renew my commitment to you right now. Father, thank you for sending your son to die on that cross for us. We didn't deserve that, but we are so appreciative you did it. God, we take this now as a way of renewing our commitment to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Turn it over and just remove the, remove the flap. This represents his blood. It says, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, this is your way of saying, I'm in it for the long run. I thank you, God, for what you did. I'm in. Father, we renew our commitment to you. We want you to know we're all in. We will follow you wherever that may lead. We'll do our best not to fuss and fight and resist, but to rather cooperate and live for you. Lord, thank you for this extra opportunity that we have to express that love for you that you also have for us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The Lord is so predictable. There's just things about God that he won't change because he's consistent, he's faithful, he's merciful. You can always count on that. He doesn't change. He is God. Because of that, you can follow him with confidence. I encourage you to do that. Now follow him, follow him, follow him. Look for those divine appointments that God has a, a divine conversation in store for the two of you. There will be people that God puts in your life that need Christ. Go tell them. Would you do that? I love you all. You're dismissed.